So, guys, take note. When I commit my future big wine crimes, I'm going to commit them in Italy. Um, what? Yeah, uh, I was reading an article, and according to Drinks Business, prison inmates in Palermo, Sicily, started a fire on New Year's Eve because they weren't served enough Prosecco. (laughs) So, not only were they being served Prosecco, uh, there wasn't enough. So, that sounds pretty criminal to me. Oh my god. I know, right? Since when do prisoners get served alcohol? No, 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 that's not what I'm shocked about. Since when were Southern Italians caught drinking Northern Italian wine? That, my friends, is the true crime here. What is the world's most expensive wine? Restaurants see high demand for low ABV cocktails. Washington and Colorado wage wine war against California, and scientists declare that beer goggles are not a thing. Well, this is The Four Top. I am your host, Catherine Cole, joined by The Four Top team, Nick Toole and Ruby Welkovich. We're a three top, but you know, that's okay. Freeze company. All right. What is the world's most expensive wine? Well, there's a new documentary to tell you all about that. Yeah, and I can't say the title gets any points for creativity. The documentary about the most expensive wine in the world is entitled, wait for it, The Most Expensive Wine in the World. (laughs) Anyway, it's been live on winemasters.tv since the 1st of January, and hey, we've watched it, so you don't have to. And uh, spoiler alert, folks, the wine in question is not Screaming Eagle, it's not DRC, it's not Petrus, but it is a Bordeaux. It's not a Poyac, a Pomerol, a Pessac Lagnon. No, no, no. It's just a Grave. Just a plain old ordinary Grave. Even after working on this podcast for three years, these names are still one big blur, but I'm guessing these are wine regions in Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. But anyway, thank you. (laughs) This wine is called... (laughs) This wine is called Liber Pater, and it's advertised in various places as selling for $30,000 a bottle or 30,000 euros a bottle, dollars, euros, exchange rates. Anyway, the point is, it's stupid expensive. Yeah, guys, I'm looking Liber Pater up on Wine Searcher right now, and I'm seeing it listed at $4,000 to $6,000 per bottle on older vintages and up to $50,000 per bottle for recent vintages like 2018 and 2019. So I have two questions. One, is the wine worth the price? And two, is this documentary worth watching? Well, as to whether it's worth the price, the vigneron, Loic Pasquet, apparently works only with ungrafted roots, which is very unusual. And these are roots that are dating back to the 19th century. And he only uses Massal selections of rare indigenous Bordeaux grape varieties. And quickly, because we want non-winos to learn a thing or two from this podcast, Massal selection is when instead of sourcing new vines from commercial nurseries, you instead take cuttings from your vineyard's best performing vines and plant those. Pasquet creates some confusion by referring to Cabernet Sauvignon, which we've all heard of, by its heirloom name Petit Verdure, I guess to make it sound fancier, and admittedly it does. Plus he's big in heirloom varieties like Castets, Tarnay, saint Macaël. Wow. Heirloom roots and ungrafted vines, this all sounds very Brooklyn Farmer's Market to me. Yeah, and he apparently releases only a couple hundred bottles each vintage, and he only makes the wine in the very best vintages. The labels are designed by the French artist Gerard Pouvy, and I would call them kind of an acquired taste. (laughs) Yeah, they're kind of (laughs) hideous. Yeah, and these vines, I mean, just get back to his his viticulture. The vines are not trellised on wires, but they're like solo staked. So they aren't even head trained. They're just kind of like standalone vines. This is a very, very old fashioned way of growing grapes. And they're, they're planted super densely at a density of about 20,000 vines per hectare, which is double the density of other top Bordeaux producers. And to just add on top of that, of course, Liber Pater is vinified in M4. Okay, so the question remains, is this wine worth the price? Well, uh, I, I want to quote from the film, toward the end of the film, the vigneron, Loic Pasquet, and forgive my terrible French accent, <laughs> he says, the price is not the question. The question is, what price would you be willing to pay to have dinner with Napoleon? <laughs> the, the point being, <laughs> the point being, he's supposedly like recreating the great Bordeaux of 1855. 
So, yeah, I mean, I'm going to say, as far as I can tell, I don't think this wine is worth the price. I think it's about a lot of hype. And, you know, I, I hear this story and my brain goes to winemakers all over the world who've been doing very similar things for years now. I'm thinking like Frank Cornelison on Mount Etna or Valentini in Abruzzo or Nate Reddy, who's been on the podcast. He's here in Oregon on the Columbia River Gorge. You know, pretty much any winemaker in the Republic of Georgia. I could go on and on and on. So I don't think that Loic Pasquet is doing anything that's really pushing the envelope and making me convinced that someone should pay $30,000 for his wine. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to applaud him for doing this in Bordeaux, however, where he is changing the conversation from a very kind of modern style with a lot of new oak to a very old school, old world style. I'm totally on board with that. Yeah, maybe I sound like a snob, but I personally only really like Bordeaux that's like pre-1985. So I do I do like what he's going for with this project. And how about the documentary? Should we watch it? Um, yeah, I you might want to hate watch it. It there's a little bit of like I got this feeling of like Marie Antoinette in the Trianon Gardens. It just is so out of touch with what's going on in the rest of the world, and it makes such a big deal out of what clearly would be uninteresting to anyone who isn't a huge wine geek. But yeah, you might want to watch it, hate watch it. Yeah, I, there was all this dramatic scoring, like violins and Gregorian chants set against not all that interesting content. There is also the suggestion that Pasquet may be thrown in jail, but it turns out he never actually was. So that's a little melodramatic. <laughs> yeah. And there's some confusing aspects to this documentary. Um, like the French wine critic, Jackie Rigaud, he keeps showing up and pontificating. But as far as I can tell, they never identify him by name. And he's also speaking French with no subtitles while everyone else in the film is speaking English. So that's like totally weird and <laughs> confusing. But I personally enjoyed watching this film because Jane Anson, the Bordeaux expert, she's a total baller. She's awesome. I totally fangirl watched it and just turned the volume up every time Jane Anson had something to say because I just wanted to hear her. Okay, so it looks like the most expensive wine in the world is not yet rated on Rotten Tomatoes, and I was debating between watching this or Saltburn tonight, and based on these reviews, I think I might have to go with Saltburn. <laughs> Proceed at your own risk. <laughs> yeah. Ruby, Catherine, have either of you ordered a low ABV cocktail recently? And wait, before you answer... I don't mean like a classic beverage that has always been low in alcohol, like Campari soda, which I love, but one that is new and exciting and marketed as low ABV. That's so funny that you bring this up this week because this past Friday I was at a restaurant with a friend and we were looking at the cocktail menu and there was an entire page dedicated to low ABV cocktails. And we were both saying that we've never seen this before and how interesting it is. And yes, as we've discussed in episode 133, Millennials, Zillennials, and Gen Zers are all looking for lower alcohol alternatives. Yeah, this is so interesting. This is the first I've heard of it, but I kind of like this idea, particularly this month as an alternative to dry January. I feel like the people who do dry January often tend to be the same people who totally overindulge the other 11 months of the year. So I, I like this low alcohol idea. This is kind of an everything in moderation approach. I don't personally love calling this alternative to dry January damp January, as some people apparently do, but I like the idea. But Cesar Hernandez recently wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle about Bay Area restaurants that are adopting hashtag low EBV cocktails and giving them the same love and attention that they would give quote unquote normal cocktails. Yes, we're talking coconut washes, pickled okra and fermented mulberries. One bar director quoted in the article calls these low ABV cocktails the new drink frontier for restaurants. Yeah, I mean, food blogger Julie Tremaine has dubbed the Hugo, a naturally low ABV cocktail, as 2024's trendiest cocktail. It's got elderflower liqueur, Prosecco, seltzer, sprigament, so not too dissimilar from an Aperol spritz. Yeah, I mean, spritzes have been a big deal for a long time now. They're still a big deal going into 2024. And, you know, another thing I've I've seen just this past few months is a trend toward mid-strength spirits. I'm seeing more of those out there. These are like gins and vodkas at 55 proof or about 30% alcohol by volume. There are some upstart brands out there like Samaroy and Luxlow and established companies like Perno Ricard are also getting into the space. Now, having tasted some no alcohol spirits before, I'm, I need to be persuaded that the flavor and the aromatics are really going to be there, but I, I'm intrigued. 
Yeah, I am too. I haven't had one of these no or low ABV spirits yet, but like Ruby, I was at a restaurant recently and I did notice that they had a whole section for low ABV cocktails and they even listed the actual alcohol percentage of the cocktail, which I had never seen before. I thought that was interesting. Okay, wine industry. I think we need to get on this train now because guess what? Wine is the original low alcohol cocktail. I mean, this is this is our lane, guys. Think about it. A martini is about like 30% alcohol by volume, whereas, say, a glass of Muscadet could be 11% alcohol by volume. So I think this is a no-brainer. We've got this. Let's push for putting alcohol percentages next to all adult beverages on restaurant menus and show the world that wine is the low-alcohol cocktail everyone has been looking for. I think wine industry, let's own January. Own damn January. That's ours. So it's not dry January. It's like a briny dry white wine from the Loire January. Yes, 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 yes. A million times. Yes. Buckle up, listeners, because our third news story is about every winery's favorite topic, distribution. Oh, yes. Alcohol distribution in the U.S. is a big old mess. And this week, we bring you a story from Colin Dreisen of Wine Spectator about a legal battle brewing between the relatively less powerful wine regions of Washington State and Colorado and the undisputed wine queen of the U.S., California. Yeah, like Catherine said, distribution is confusing, costly, kind of all over the map. But two tiny wineries outside of California are trying to simplify things by contesting California's law that allows California wineries and only California wineries to self-distribute to retailers. That is, like, sell directly to the retailer without using a distributor. For small producers, working with a distributor can be difficult, and small producers, they don't often get treated as well as larger producers, so you can see why they would want to be able to self-distribute. This is exciting stuff. Interstate commerce, let's go. (laughs) <laughs> um, okay, so as Dreisen points out, this lawsuit is similar to legal battles in other states where wine producers and retailers are balking against what they say are out-of-date laws tied to the 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition, but in doing so gave the state's power to legislate the trade of alcohol across state lines. Quoting from the article here, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said laws restricting alcohol sales must be for either maintaining orderly markets or promoting temperance not for benefiting local businesses. Yeah, the National Association of Wine Retailers, aka NAR, trade organization, (laughs) (laughs) NAR supports the lawsuit with the NAR executive director, Tom Wark, telling Wine Spectator, this lawsuit will help the state's retailers, it will open new distribution avenues for out-of-state wineries, and it will give California consumers more choices. And I think, yeah, if it's successful, it may inspire other states to drop some of their similar restrictions. Uh, and Ruby, where, why are we? Why are you laughing so hard right now? <laughs> I'm laughing because there's this whole trend on TikTok of people saying no in Australian accents, exactly the way Nick just pronounced this. <laughs> oh, this wow. wine association, NAR. <laughs> I'm 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 right in with the uh, with the times, I guess. You're super trendy. <laughs> I am going to use that in my next cocktail party conversation. I'm going to bring it up somehow. Um, But anyway, folks, this may sound like another really boring story about interstate commerce and the three-tier system, but I'm my ears are perking up here. I'm actually kind of invested in this myself. I'm an Oregon wine person who spends a lot of time in California, and I find it super frustrating to not be able to find good Oregon wines at California wine shops. And I wonder if this would help Oregon wineries out, allow them to kind of strike some deals directly with retailers. I specifically have in mind the larger kind of big box retailers like BevMo, Total Wine and More. I'm consistently frustrated by their Oregon wine selection. Then again, I don't know that this will make that big of a difference. Californians tend to drink California wine and, you know, who can blame them? They want to support their own local uh, winemakers. Um, But where this may make a difference if this lawsuit is successful is in sort of specialty wine shops, specialty bottle shops, um, little little wine stores that specialize in things like natural wines. I think this might be interesting in opening up opportunities for small producers. I noticed that one of the plaintiffs is Dwinell Country Wines, which is a natural wine, beer and cider producer on the Washington side of the Columbia Gorge. So they're making like real niche specialty products. I like to call it hipster juice. Um, so yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on this. this. This is interesting and hope that I can see some more interesting wines from other states in California when I'm down there. 
Of course, I love California wine as well. I just want to make that clear. We were starting to wonder, Catherine. <laughs> Um, so guys, for our last story of the day, I need to apologize because I did misspeak in our last episode. Uh-oh, why? So Martin Reyes, Master of Wine, we were talking about, actually we were talking about alcohol being good for our, our health, but we were also talking about the dangers posed by alcohol. And I said something about like, if you drink too much, that you're in danger of making out with someone you don't even find attractive. And guess what? It turns out that science may have proven me wrong on that front. That is right. The drinks business recently flagged a study published last month in the Journal of Psychopharmacology, which is another fun science word. And apparently these researchers got a bunch of people drunk, which is always a great way to start things off, and then showed them photos of other people. And alcohol seemed not to influence whether or not they found the people in the photos attractive. But they did find that alcohol impairs the drinker's ability to detect facial asymmetry. Wait, hold on. So the participants didn't find others more attractive, but they had trouble detecting asymmetry in faces? Isn't facial symmetry a big part of attractiveness? I mean, I guess so, but the researchers claim they didn't find a connection between detecting asymmetry while drunk and determining hotness while drunk. And yes, hotness is a technical term. And <laughs> my personal question is, how did they find funding for the study and in what way is the study pushing science forward? Because who cares? This is important stuff. <laughs> but uh, another similar study found that intoxication did make participants more likely to feel confident approaching someone they already found attractive. So there's evidence of that so-called liquid courage, which is the same thing that makes me say, I'm pretty sure I could jump this fence when I'm intoxicated. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> as long as it's not an electric fence, you're good. <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> well, now it is time for our dessert course, and it's my turn. I just finished this morning this novel. It's called The Land of Milk and Honey by C. Pam Zhang. It's about a post-apocalyptic world after a climate catastrophe. And in this world, the rich and powerful all end up on an Italian mountaintop, and they're kind of like hoarding the last of the great food and wine. So they're just fabulous descriptions of cooking and eating and drinking, and it sort of opens up a lot of discussions about uh, stratification between classes, the haves and the have-nots, and it really made me kind of rethink the whole gourmand culture. So I highly recommend everyone check out this book. It sounds really depressing, but the author has a great sense of humor as well. So check it out. That sounds great. Yeah, I, I, I got a kick out of it, I must say. And before we sign off, I just want to send a salute to the wine journalist Andy Blue, more formally known as Anthony Dias Blue, who sadly died on Christmas Day. Andy was the longtime wine and spirits editor for Bon Appetit magazine. He was the founding editor of Tasting Panel magazine. And for many years, he ran the San Francisco International Wine Competition, which I believe is how I got to know him. He accomplished so much for wine, but what I really remember him for was his enthusiasm. You know, sometimes we forget that wine is fun. And Andy made sure that wine was fun every minute of every day. So a fun farewell to Andy Blue. This has been the Four Top Podcast. I am our executive producer, Catherine Cole. I'm our producer, Nick Toole. And I'm media and design manager, Ruby Welkovich. Keelan King is our sound supervisor and the composer and performer of our fantastic theme music. Please visit our website, thefortop.org, to learn more about us and listen to back episodes. And if you have not already subscribed to The Four Top on iTunes or Spotify, please do so and please leave us a rating. Hey, y'all, this part's important. Every rating feeds the algorithm and helps new listeners find the foretop. From the rainy land of milk and honey, this is Catherine Cole signing out. From the finally snowy seaside city of Portland, Maine, this is Nick Toole signing out. And from the somewhat snowy, although very cold, Brooklyn, New York, this is Ruby signing out. Stay safe out there and thanks for listening. <laughs>